So here we go. Now recording's in progress. I will go ahead and say good morning, everybody. It is Thursday, November 4th, 2021. Isaba is in the house. We've come to do a November member meeting here online. The member meeting is Haps in the Hood. We're talking about three things Isaba's watching this um, this fall, and we've got some great special guests and some great Isaba colleagues to talk things over with. So we're going to talk about hams development, redevelopment today. We'll talk a little bit about the bike plan, and we'll talk about east side safety with our senior commander, uh, senior Kurt, uh, commander Kurt Hallstrom from St. Paul PD, if he's able to get on today. So, yep, I called it uh, hams redevelopment, reinventing the wheel, and east side safety. So there you go. It's going to be a fast hour, and you kind of know the program. So I'll put our agenda up in the chat. Welcome you to uh, change your name to include the place you're from um, and your pronouns, if you'd like, and then drop some brief information about you in the chat so people can scroll and kind of get to know you a little bit there. And folks have already started doing that. While I post our agenda, I'll also just in... Um, go ahead and share about our annual sponsors here. And then I'll invite you to turn on your uh, camera and we'll do a brief rundown of who's in the room. All right, here comes our agenda. Here comes our annual sponsors. So Isaba would just like to thank these annual sponsors for helping us get through the year and keeping it fun. Uh, Ideal Printers, DB Creative, Harrington Langer and Associates and State mm -hmm. Farm the Office of Juan Cervantes, Sane Foundation, M Health Fairview, St. Paul Federal Credit Union and the St. Paul Port Authority, Highway Credit Union, Sunrise Banks, Metropolitan State University, Mueller Memorial, Premier Banks, Walters Recycling and Refuse, and Health Partners. Thank you, partners. All right, back to us. If you've got your camera on, we'll do a quick wave through of who we got on the show today with us. If you are a part of an east side business out there, give us a wave. East side business, if you do business on the east, no. If you're part of an east side business, I see Darren Varley from BB Creative. I see Crystal Hollins from 180 Degrees. Who else is from an east side business? I saw Chelsea DeArmond. Oh, I see Nathan. Nathan, that is a gigantic, <laughs> that's a background from the distillery. That looks like a gigantic aircraft or something. That's amazing. All right. Nathan from 11 Wells, welcome to the program. I saw Chelsea from TC Tubes. Here's Chelsea. Any other businesses, small businesses, any size business today? Okay. How about uh, Eastside Nonprofit? Oh, well, the St. Paul Saints is a business. Krista? Yeah. Krista Schnelli from St. Paul Saints. How about Eastside Nonprofits? If you're an Eastside Nonprofit, go ahead and give us a wave. That's Krista from uh, the Historic Mounds Theater. Um, Crystal from 180 Degrees, Rebecca from one of five or six nonprofits, but maybe Eastside Elders, Kayla from Eastside Elders, Elaine, hi Elaine, from Hazel Park Learning Center. Uh, who else? Okay, yes, David, David Akos from District 2 and Wababa. I think that's all of our nonprofits. Chelsea, five from Visit St. Paul, 501C6, we'll call you a nonprofit, why not? That's fun. You are. Okay, if you are from something else that's exciting that we should know about, well, yeah, NDC, we had NDC, that's a nonprofit, Jesse, for sure. Okay, great. Um, all right, other fantastic things happening like the public-private partnership that is the St. Paul Port Authority. I see Tanya Bauer. Oh, and she is showing her fall colors today. That's a view from Mounds Park, is it? Oh, no, that's a view from the west side. That's from my, that's a view from my neighborhood. And Lori Sieber from the St. Paul Port Authority, too. And Lori's got a new background today. That is not what we're used to seeing. That must be your actual office. Oh, that's great. All right, it's fun to have our actual offices. Um, all right, how about other special guests and other folks on the call? Stephanie Haar from Jane Prince's office. Hi, Steph, good to see you. Yolanda Davis from a number of awesome East Side uh, <laughs> organizations, but Metro State is kind of how Metro State Community Engagement is part of how we've been working together. Um, all right, and then we've got our special guests today too. Jimmy Schumacher from the city of St. Paul talking to us about reinventing the wheel today. Excited about that. Andy Hesnes from the city of St. Paul. I hope I'm saying both of your names right, guys. Uh, gonna talk to us about HAMS redevelopment. You're from PED, right, Andy? 
you know, Jimmy, one of the things, sorry, switching back to Jimmy for a second. One of the things I want to, let's just talk about it, are the number of places you put up bike racks on the east side this last couple of years. That'd be fun to know. Um, I see Joel Anderson, one of my favorites from Ramsey County, from Biz Recycling. And I told Joel in a meeting yesterday that this month is review your solid waste savings appreciation month at Isaba. So we'll be talking about Biz Recycling later in the call. See, that made Joel smile and the rest of the heads behind him smile too. Um, we've got Rick Howden, another favorite from Ramsey County. Hey, Rick, turn on your uh, camera if you're here, man. Yeah, hi there, Rick. So Rick was on the uh, rapid response team. Are you still on the rapid response team? He doesn't know. I don't know if it ever really existed, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it's definitely slowed down. So there's not, uh, not so much going on nowadays. Okay, it's not as rapid. But it's still a response, okay, for working with businesses on uh, navigating over the last year and a half. Rick, it's always good to see you upright, you know, still standing and on the show. Have I missed anyone? I see Katrina from Eastside Elders. We have three Eastside Elders folks, or is that you, Kayla, in disguise? No, three Eastside Elders folks today. That's totally great. Okay, perfect. Um, so Jesse, you are new to the program in addition to our other special guests. Jesse, just tell us what you do. Yes, I'm the uh, senior real estate asset manager for NDC. So I oversee all of our um, uh, incubator commercial space for the company. So right now, this background here, this fall kind of background, I am over in Minneapolis on East Lake Street at the Midtown Global Market, which is one of our retail incubators. So doing a few walkthroughs before the before snow hits. So. Very fun. Yes, it, oh, yes. and the ominous mention of snow. Boy, Jesse, I know. cold. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I know. No, that's not happening. We're going to be 60 degrees on Saturday. I know, yeah. right? It'll be it's good. Be crazy. Um, we do oh, have a fabulous incubator over at 809 East 7th Street that we partner with the Day uh, Dayton's Bluff Neighborhood Council. Uh, so Jim Urchel. Um, it's an uh, incubator that is uh, geared towards contractors and construction workers and companies. So it's the very specific use. Um, it's a really great site. So we do have vacancy over there. So if anybody would like to check it out, just let us know. Totally great. Uh, how many people have seen what Jesse's talking about? The incubator redevelopment that's right on 7th Street. Uh, there's a new ice cream store that's right in the front of it. Pura Pecha. Correct. Yep. And we're right next to Clues. So, hey, yeah, right next to yep. great mural mm -hmm. on the side too. Anybody see yep. that? All right, next time I ask that question, everybody's hands going in the air, right? Totally great, cool resource right by the consulate, right across from um, District 4 Community Council with one of Eastside uh, Area Business Association's members, Dayton's Bluff mm -hmm. Neighborhood Housing Services and, and yes. Jim Mitchell. Yes. So totally great. We'll be talking more. Jesse, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right. Have I missed anybody else? Oh, we've got Haley from, uh, from Urban Roots. Haley, welcome. Let's go ahead and jump right in, everybody. Oh, yes. Haley, you also have hair for the season. That was great. Oh, that was such a, just a brief. Oh, no, there she is. I just, you're moving around my screen. Uh, we were talking about uh, looking like fall, and you are all bundled up, too. All right. Well, I'm glad to have you all on the program. Here we go, folks. Let's also uh, just make some good things happen today as we have great conversation together. So you see that on our agenda is that we've got, uh, we, have three, we have three fantastic things to talk about today. We're gonna kick it off with Andy Hessness from the city of St. Paul and talk about Ham's redevelopment. Um, as many of you recall, Isaba was just at the Ham's Brewery for our gala, Historic Ham's Brewery. Um, we were at the St. Paul um, owned side with St. Paul Brewing and have seen what they've done on the patio there. So part of our conversation today is learning more about the city's plans for redevelopment there and about how we get a closer look um, a little later this month at the space we're talking about. But I wanna turn it over to Mr. Hessness. Welcome to the show. Um, would you like to share your screen at all? Do you have anything you'd like to pop up for us to look at? Yeah, I, I brought just a couple quick slides. So uh, Paris asked me to give you a little teaser for uh, an upcoming sort of community um, 
um, invitation to really join us and, and learn about this RFP process, but we're excited to be here in, in front of you and sharing uh, what's going on. I feel a little nervous to present this in front of uh, the esteemed Rick Howden because I actually took the project over from him a couple of years ago. So hopefully uh, we've taken it in good direction, Rick. I'll try to do you proud. Um, it's It's been a really fun one. Um, so I will uh, see if I can make the screen share work. Let's see. And is that popping up for folks? Great. All right. Um, so the Hams Brewery, the uh, City of St. Paul through our Housing Redevelopment Authority um, acquired basically the section of the brewery that existed south of Minnehaha in about 2004. Um, we have been working on uh, redevelopment of that portion uh, since that time. Uh, Nathan from Eleven Wells knows that well. He's in one of the buildings that uh, we work to help um, sell and, and assisted them in, in some of the redevelopment. Um, but obviously the Hams complex has a long, long history uh, here on the east side. Um, so on the left here, kind of a famous photo of the campus. Um, they've been brewing beer at the location since 1865. This is the um, 1890s version of the brew house, the very ornate. Um, a lot of these buildings are still there, although they've been um, modified many, many times in the famous Hams mansion up the hill behind. Um, the image on the right is uh, a more modern view. So some of the same buildings, um, but you can see they've been added on to, modified, changed, especially in the 50s. Um, but the, it is a major, major structure. Um, and it's it really kind of part of the heart and soul of the east side as far as one of those um, employers that, you know, back 50 some years ago, this is where just about everybody worked. Um, and everybody had a friend or a relative or a contact who was connected to hams in some way. So uh, it really is an important site. And we've been trying to figure out how we can honor that history. And at the same time, um, you know, really bring something exciting to bring some activity back to the site um, into the area. A um, little, little bit of orientation. I know a lot of you are going to be familiar with this. Um, on the left, we've got uh, just a little uh, kind of sighting image. So the Hams Brewery, the portion that's owned by the HRA is outlined in yellow there. Um, and it really is this kind of pivot point of so many um, different um, pieces of activity on the east side. So we've got the Payne Avenue Commercial Corridor highlighted in blue, uh, East 7th, Arcade Street. It's really right in the middle of all of those, the Phelan Corridor as well. Um, and we've got a couple of the um, upcoming transit lines shown in this diagram as well. So the Purple Line, formerly called the Rush Line, um, we're very close to a stop um, that's planned for that. And also um, just barely at the bottom of the screen, you can see the Gold Line um, station um, in Dayton's Bluff is also not too far. Uh, on the right side, we've got an image. This is a, a survey of the site. The portion here also in yellow highlighted is what the HRA owns. So we have sold off a couple of different components of this site. Um, the St. Paul Brewing Complex is owned um, by that organization. Eleven Wells owns their building. Um, and then the, uh, the other portion there that had been sold off were Urban Organics had been operated. It's been um, gone through a couple um, sales. It's actually for sale right now privately. At the same time, our uh, public sale and RFP process is going forward um, for the, the portions we own. So it really includes uh, both buildings and land um, and a large parking lot um, to the east um, and a lot of the just pieces in between. What we are looking for with this RFP and why we're really reaching out to the development community is we're trying to find a partner who can help us knit all these different pieces together. So we've got a bunch of great operating businesses on the site. Um, we've got, you know, obviously Sweet Hollow Park, the Bruce Vento Bike Trail, all these commercial corridors and, and um, you know, lots of activity going on. How can this be sort of the, the linchpin to a lot of, of that activity and, and bring that energy back to the site? Um, so we're really looking for someone who has the vision um, to either, you know, do it all themselves or bring together a team of other smaller developers um, to, to propose something that, that honors the site's history and, and knits those pieces together, as I mentioned. Um, if this works, I'm going to try to give folks a view that maybe they haven't seen before. Hope this is coming through. So we did some drone footage recently just to orient folks to the site a little bit. So um, the majority of the buildings um, here in front, um, kind of with the graffiti on top, unfortunately, uh, are the portion owned by the HRA. This is starting to pan uh, towards the east. So now we're looking over the building that is St. Paul Brewing, and you see a little bit of their patio as well. Uh, so the HRA owns um, the courtyard to the north of that, 
um, and that brewery is sold. So now we're kind of flying over the 11 Wells building towards that larger parking lot I was mentioning. Um, this is going to be, uh, it's another portion of the site. The HRA owns all that land. Um, you see some construction activity. This is a fairly recent video. We've been working on installing some stormwater management, um, getting that parking lot ready um, to either continue its life as a parking lot or support um, a new building that might need some stormwater management as well. But that's really getting the site ready and doing, doing what we can to manage um, stormwater and do the right thing for the environment on that. Um, so now we've flipped and we're headed the other direction, flying back west over St. Paul Brewing. Um, you see a little silo there that's down in the Swede Hollow um, Bruce Vento Trail. Uh, we do own an, a bit of that property down below. Here's kind of looking from the other side. Um, and, and so there's this large outdoor space as well that comes with what the HRA has. Um, so this is looking back east again, the portion with the dark red is St. Paul Bruin and everything um, that's in that lighter, creamier color, um, you know, moving along from there. Those are the, the set of buildings that the HRA owns. The building on the front with the smokestack is not an HRA property. We only own those things south of Minnehaha, but we've got seven interconnected buildings there, as well as um, that one standalone smaller building right off the bridge. Um, you see on the right side of the screen, uh, really large site. So we're looking at about 165,000 square foot of um, space within these buildings. A lot of different floor plates. These were purpose-built buildings uh, for the brewing process. Um, so there's a lot of quirks um, to how these different buildings were interconnected and built, uh, but a lot of really interesting potential. Um, as you can kind of start to see, it's, it's, it's a really green, lush part of the city. And we've got all that great park access, trail access, um, and then as you start to pan around here you, um, from those upper floors, we really have some, some great downtown views as well. So there's, um, you know, this, this sort of sense of the, the Hams complex has always kind of loomed over Sweet Hollow and um, ho hopefully not in a negative way, but just it's got this presence in the neighborhood that's really visible um, that we can, um, you know, make that connection point back to the community on um, coming into the screen on the right side is Hope Academy, their um, expansion project has been going on. And that's another former Hams building, the old administration building. Um, so we, all, all those different parts um, of the, the campus really, it's been good to see certain parts of that get reactivated and hoping to um, take the opportunity with these last set of buildings that have stayed vacant um, to, to bring them back and, and have them contributing in some way. Um, we've set this up in a way it's pretty flexible. Um, we're open to really most any ideas. The site's currently zoned industrial. Our comp plan guidance um, indicates this is a mixed use opportunity site. So we really would consider just about anything if it's commercial, if it's office, if it's housing, um, all of those types of uses would, would make sense on this site um, and, and have some uh, connectivity to the other things going on. So we're, we're excited about the opportunity. Um, we think, um, you know, we've been really trying to get the word out, um, hoping that you all can help us get the word out, um, either bring your own ideas or um, share it with folks that might be interested in it. But that's, that's really the phase we're in right now is the RFP is open. Um, we just are in the process of announcing we've extended our end date. So the responses will be due on uh, January 31st. Um, so that's, that's our process right now. We've got that solicitation out um, looking for people to respond. We've got some site tours um, for pro potential proposers. And what's coming up on the 18th is actually a community oriented tour. So we wanted to make sure the community had a chance to um, take a look around the, the site, see some of the buildings, um, how some of these pieces fit together. It's a very complicated site to be perfectly honest. So it, it really helps to walk through and um, then we'll take a peek inside one of the buildings as well. Um, just to give folks a sense, I think this building has been closed for so long. The brewery closed in 97. Um, you know, a lot of people don't have the sense of what it looks like inside, but um, you know, so many people we walk through, um, they said, oh, my, my dad used to work here. My grandpa used to work here. Um, and it's, it's great to kind of give people that opportunity to see, um, see what's going on on the site. So um, with that, um, I am happy to take any questions. That was a real quick overview, um, but uh, I know Paris will be sharing more information. We've got on the 18th, um, a, an in-person tour on the site, as well as um, uh, uh, we'll have sort of a Zoom meetup afterwards for some question opportunity later that evening and, and working with a number of different community groups to, um, um, to bring that together and, and provide some opportunity. So um, I see I got a couple hands here. Um, I can just start calling on folks. So the first one I saw was uh, Councilmember Prince. Thanks so much, Andy. I, um, I, I just wanted to jump in here and say, 
how completely thrilled I am that PED at this point in time has seen the potential of this amazing site. And um, Andy has done phenomenal work along with Laura Hansen. And I, and I wanna say, um, I don't know if, if all of you have met Nicole Goodman, but she was um, brought on as our PED director in August of our COVID year. Um, so you may not have had a chance to meet her in person, but sometime around December, um, Nicole called me and said, Jane, I'm looking at this ham site and it is very exciting. She said, we had something very similar in Oklahoma City where she worked. And she said, I just see tremendous potential here. So after all the years that all of us have waited for things to come together in a major way, we've obviously had um, smaller developments that have been great, like urban organics, like 11 Wells, obviously um, St. Paul Brewing and all the work that um, is, is being done to that right now. But I, I think that all of us felt like there was tremendous potential here and our PED staff has really come together to, um, to, make, to make this an appealing and attractive development opportunity and I can't thank them enough. And that's all I wanted to say. Council member. Um, it's also saw we got a couple comments in the chat, so I'll jump to a couple of those and then I'll uh, jump over to Anne. Um, so um, Rebecca asked, what happened to the Can Can Wonderland deal? Did that fall through? Um, no, I wouldn't say it fell through. We've been in touch with them all along. Um, as, as it's HRA owned property, we, we always need to have a public process um, to select a, a proposal to move forward with. Um, so we do expect um, that, you know, they are that they, they may pro provide a proposal to us um, or certainly continue to be discussing um, some of their vision for the site. Um, and we want, you know, are, are really open to uh, both their ideas as well as, as everyone. We wanna make sure this gets really wide coverage um, and, and that we get all the ideas that are out there as far as um, what the site could be. Uh, let's see, Jesse asks, is there a goal with the site um, that we're looking to achieve more housing office industrial retail? We open to new concepts and ideas that have not been reviewed. Um, we're absolutely open to new ideas. Um, you know, trying to emphasize, I think all of those um, concepts are, are available for this site. Um, as I mentioned that there's a parking lot. So in addition to reusing the buildings, there's some opportunity for new construction on the site as well. Um, so really, I think, you know, what are the components that make sense? You know, and to a certain extent, we're looking to the community and the development community to um, answer that for us. Um, I think we're, we're going in open-eyed that, um, you know, redevelopment of uh, old buildings like this can be complicated, especially buildings that um, are big flat floors. Some of these are sloped floors to deal with the brewing process and holes and all sorts of uh, interesting challenges. So um, we want to kind of see what, what are the development concepts that fit in a building like this, um, but we're definitely open um, to lots of different ideas. Um, maybe I'll jump over to Anne and I can jump back to some of these comments in the chat then. Anne, did you really? Sure, thank you, Andy, and thanks for the presentation. You know, as you mentioned, this building's been vacant since 1997. I can remember um, developers talking about concepts for that building back when Norm Coleman was the mayor and um, several since then. Um, the city's putting the RFP out and looking at potential development. Are there resources at the city? Are you expecting um, potential developers to come in with their own sources and uses or are there going to be resources? Because um, a lot of developers have prospected this property and walked away um, throughout the 24 years that it's been vacant. Yeah, it, it's a great question, Anne. So, um, you know, we've, we've looked at this and I think um, some of what we also have at this point is um, some good examples regionally of other challenging sites like this. I think of Schmidt Brewery, I think of the Pillsbury A-Mill, um, and sort of how those types of projects have come together. Um, 
you know, I, I think we're expecting that there's going to need to be some public participation in this project. Um, that, I, you know, I'm not going to say that would just be from the city. I think there's a lot of potential, um, you know, state, federal sources um, and, and regional sources as well. There's, you know, likely some cleanup needed here, um, you know, that we can talk about it. Um, the site is not historically designated, but there's been some analysis of that. There could be historic tax, cred tax credits at the state or federal level. Um, so I think there's a lot of resources in our our expectation is we're looking for a partner that's going to um, know how to work with a lot of these public and private sources and be able to work with us then on, on a full package. But we're, we're anticipating getting those kinds of asks and, and looking really hard because it's it's important for us to see this move forward. And I think we're we understand that um, there will need to be a public component for this project as well. Thank you. And I just also to say, though, um, you know, nothing has been sort of pre-authorized and all, all of those have their own review and approval processes. So, well, you know, all of that will have to be evaluated. We've got first the RFP selection process. And then as we move forward, all of that funding and financing project would, um, would have its own approval process. And, you know, don't want to get ahead of that, but, um, you know, just nothing, nothing's been pre-committed, but it's certainly part of the conversation we've, we've had get to get us to this point. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Confirm yeah. the date of the community tour. Um, November 18th, um, I believe 3 p.m. Um, is the, the time we're meeting on site for the tour. Um, and then I think uh, I'd have to look. I, I want to say we had the community Zoom at a 7 p.m. that evening. That's right. Uh, okay, great. Um, Steph, Stephanie Har had put some detail about that in the chat as well. Oh, great. I'm working my way down. <laughs> no, no, you're doing fine. Um, and we're, we'll work on transitioning here as well. Feel free to drop any other comments and questions into the chat. But there was one question about um, from Nathan. Maybe we'll finish on this unless someone else has got something. Uh, that the, the parking lot construction, do we have a finish date for the parking lot construction? And, you know, Nathan asked that because he's trying to figure out where to park his bike. He worked right there. Well, we're we're pretty well encircling their building, so I understand their concern at the moment. Um, we um, we're we're looking at um, late November to early December as a completion on that project. Um, we've got the concrete work proceeding on that. All the underground system has been installed at this point, um, so we are getting gearing up for. Um, putting back the asphalt on the parking lot in the area we had to dig up in the next one, two weeks and landscaping following that. So uh, moving right along, we've, we've got some kind of hard deadlines with the weather that we can't entirely control. So we're trying to move as fast as we can. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was just kidding about Nathan's bike. Anyway, we have some other folks who uh, showed up on, on the program as well and just wanted to acknowledge. And also, if you're not Speaking currently, just go ahead and make sure you're on mute. But we've got uh, Council Member Jane Prince, uh, who also chimed in earlier, and Anda Joy from ESNBC. Um, who we also had some other people pop on, which is great. And somebody that I don't know, that looks like Chester. Is that Chester? Hey, Chester Saki from Premium Moving. Welcome to the yeah, program. How are you? How are you? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Doing great. Great to see you. Totally great to see you. Um, let's, we're gonna switch gears and talk a little bit, you know, like like change gears, like you're changing right there on the handlebars and talk with Jimmy Schumacher, Schumacher about our city bike plan. Uh, Jimmy, I'm gonna turn it over to you if I have control again, or Andy, I just ask if you have control, go ahead and make uh, Jimmy the Jimmy the host and then we'll, we'll hear a little bit from him. Hi everyone. Thanks a lot for having me, Paris. Uh, great to see such a huge group. Uh, this is my first time at an Asaba meeting and I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, I am trying to share my screen. It says I'm not able to. Um, All right, we'll get that remedied here. Thanks. Uh, but in the meantime, my name is Jimmy Shoemaker. I work uh, for the city of St. Paul. Uh, Department of Public Works. Um, specifically, I work in a smaller division called Transportation Planning and Safety. A um, little bit about myself. Uh, I've been with the city for about a year, but i um, been working in transportation planning and design, street design for, um, for about five years now. Uh, I grew up in St. Paul. 
I uh, went to St. Paul Central High School and uh, Obama Elementary in Ramsey. Uh, and I live in the Midway neighborhood now. So um, uh, I'm still not able to present. Um, so Andy, if you will just go up, uh, you're still the host, Andy. If you'll go up to Jimmy, you should in the participants line, you should be able to just click on him, click over on more and make him the host. All right, hopefully that did it. All right, thanks guys. Great, uh, you can all see my screen it looks like. Thank you. Great, um, well, I am here to talk today about the St. Paul bicycle plan update. <clears throat> um, I appreciate Harris, the, all the references you've made uh, in the agenda um, and today switching gears, I like that. Um, uh, so I'm gonna keep this pretty brief um, and uh, hopefully have time at the end for, for questions. Um, I mentioned um, I work in the Department of Public Work. So, you know, we do all sorts of things. Some of them I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Um, we fix potholes. Uh, we work with garbage and recycling. Um, we do the striping and the signing on our streets. Uh, we think about parking. Um, uh, specifically what I do in this smaller group called Transportation Planning and Safety is think a bit uh, longer term. Um, so we focus on things like the pedestrian plan um, or um, we work on kind of long range transit projects, a couple of them that Andy mentioned a moment ago, uh, and then the bike plan. So um, we're specifically working on an update to that. And that's what I'm here to talk with you today about. Uh, this is a timeline of this update process. So um, uh, you can see we're in the fall here. Um, and uh, we're kind of at the end of our fall engagement. So I've spoken to um, most of the district councils. Um, some of you on here might have already heard this presentation, so I'm sorry if it's a bit repetitive. Um, uh, we've spoken um, with other groups. Uh, we've been coordinating with St. Paul Public Schools because we know how important walking and biking to school is for for young people. Um, so I have a whole list, running list of, of those we've spoken to. Um, and actually I, I plan to speak with the St. Paul Chamber of Commerce um, uh, in the next couple of weeks. So, um, and then you'll see over the winter, we're gonna be taking uh, all the feedback we heard this fall uh, and drafting some updates, which I'll tell you about in a second. And then hopefully I'll be back in the spring to talk to you all again about kind of what we heard and what we're gonna to do to update the plan with the hopes that um, we get the updated bicycle plan adopted by city council uh, next summer. So I mentioned we have a bike plan now, we're just updating that plan. Uh, the first plan was adopted in March, 2015. Um, and it really what it is, is it um, plans for the development of the network of bicycle facilities. And when I say bicycle facilities, I mean anything that people biking ride on. So that could be something like a, a, like a bike lane on Payne Avenue. Uh, it could be something uh, like uh, the Bruce Vento Trail that Chelsea mentioned she rode on today. Um, it could be something like a uh, bike boulevard, like on Margaret. Um, so uh, we, we look at the plan that exists now and we say, as opportunities arise, so say we're out um, resurfacing a street via mill and overlay, we think, hey, is there space on this street? Can we rethink the space just as part of um, the resurfacing and restriping of the road um, to put in bike facilities? In that case, usually it means something like a bike lane, but as we think about something more intense like a street reconstruction, uh, where we kind of tear up the entire street, um, that's our chance to really rethink the spaces between building face and building face uh, to, to implement the bike plan. Uh, also through new development. Um, so uh, as far as I know, Andy, we aren't creating new streets as part of the HAMS redevelopment, but on things like um, say um, uh, Hillcrest Golf Course, for example. So, 
um, we're putting in new streets. So what does that mean? Uh, can we uh, build more of the bike network? And then also, like Andy mentioned, through transit projects. Um, so what, how can we improve bike facilities in the city as part of, say, the purple line or the gold line? And then just generally as a reference for other planning efforts. So Andy and his colleagues and PED, I'm sure, reference the, the bike plan as they think about um, their projects. So the, the big thing that came out of the current bike plan, which was in 2015, is what you see on screen there. And this is a map of all the streets in St. Paul. And this is just the planned bicycle network. Um, so this says uh, on any given street, it identifies um, the facility type that we plan to construct as opportunities arise. And you'll notice that there are different colored lines um, and they represent different facilities. So I mentioned like the Bruce Vento trail is an off street path and that's shown in green. Um, whereas a red line on the map represents just a striped bike lane, perhaps like one you would see on, on Payne. Uh, there's also a purple line that represents a bike boulevard, which I, I'll talk about a little bit, which is just kind of a neighborhood slow street that we try to calm traffic on in order to make it a shareable space for people biking and walking. And I do wanna just uh, kind of zoom in on the east side, of course. And so this is just zoomed in on then that same map so all of these lines represent uh, planned, uh, planned bike facilities. So some of them exist because this is from 2015 and we've slowly kind of chipped away at it uh, as opportunities have arisen, um, but not all of them. This is just the planned bike network. And what we're doing as part of this update is we are um, thinking, we're, we're taking another um, crack at uh, is, this, is a bike lane the best facility for this given street. So in other words, as part of this update, we might look at a street and say, hmm, uh, there's, there's a lot of traffic on this street and speeds are pretty fast. Maybe this street, instead of a simple bike lane, should be identified and planned for something off street. And I'll show some pictures of those. Um, uh, here's another image, These, this is what exists currently or as of uh, April of this year on, on the east side. So if this is the planned network, these lines, we've slowly made progress um, and this is what actually exists on the east side. So we still want to expand the bike network um, on the east side and across the city. Um, just quickly, some progress we've made since 2015. These are pictures, um, uh, none of these are on the east side, but I do have, of course, uh, an image of, of, of a bike facility on the east side. This is in my neighborhood. Uh, we've, well, we've implemented 67 miles citywide, and that's a little out of date um, because we've done some more this year. Here's Fairview, north of University. And these are all images of, of the Grand Round, um, which is kind of a big loop around the city. Johnson Parkway is a great example on the east side. Um, of the grand round um, uh, of a nice kind of off street facility. Uh, of course, here's pain before 2015 and here's pain as it looks today. So um, as part of the bike plan, we installed striped bike lanes. Um, but I do wanna talk about why we are updating the plan. Um, it's specifically, I've mentioned this a couple times, um, separated facilities. And that's um, spaces that are removed from traffic. So um, I'll show you some pictures, but we want to make sure that we provide more guidance on those because we've heard from folks that that's what they want. Um, we've heard from people saying the thing that'll get me riding on a bike or riding with my kid or riding with my grandmother is a safer and more comfortable space in a separated facility. We also want to identify new priorities. So like I said, we've made a lot of progress, but kind of what's next? What's the next thing we want to focus on? Um, we also want, we've heard from folks that say, uh, hey, I'd really love to ride during the winter, but I can't because invariably snow and ice accumulates in the bike lane. Um, and so we want to be a bit more explicit about what it means to um, operate and maintain a, a really high quality bike network. Um, and then the biggest thing, bottom line, is we just need to plan for more separated facilities, separated between biking and people driving. And that's really kind of the best practice at the state and national level. 
And so we want to bring our plan more in line with that. So here are some, exi uh, some examples of separated facilities. Uh, you can see this is on Jackson in downtown St. Paul. You can see why we call this separated. This is a two-way facility um, separated from car traffic and people walking on the left side. Um, and it's separated by something kind of heavy duty. So not just a striped line, it's separated uh, by you know, a, a planted buffer or a sign or a tree. Um, and that's really what makes people feel safe when they're riding, not just a striped line, but something that cars would run into if they tried to encroach on your space as a biker. Uh, shared use paths are very similar, except they're shared between people biking and walking. So where we don't have quite enough space to install two separate spaces for people biking and walking, we feel comfortable combining those as long as they're separated from car traffic. So here's along Como Avenue next to the state fairgrounds. A couple more examples. Uh, this is Pelham Boulevard, uh, and this is in downtown on 10th Street uh, in downtown St. Paul. You see it separated from car traffic by these kind of big beefy curbs. Um, examples of ones that are not separated bike lanes, um, you see them all over. Payne Avenue is a good example. That's just a bike lane. Summit Avenue is just a bike lane. Uh, bike boulevards uh, in my neighborhood um, and on Margaret in, on the east side. Um, and it, it's not to say we're going to stop constructing these. Um, we will continue planning and constructing these where they are appropriate. But we do want to start moving away from installing simple bike lanes on streets that are just too busy and have too much traffic. Because we know that the large majority of people don't feel comfortable riding on that. I mentioned we're kind of at the tail end of, I just have a couple more slides, at the tail end of um, engagement for this fall. The biggest push and something I would invite you all um, to share or to take yourself is this survey. It's at stpaul.gov slash bike plan. And the survey is only open for a few more days. Um, so I would encourage you if you haven't, um, to take that um, now or very soon. Um, if you take it next week, um, I will, I'll still get the responses. So um, but it's just we're kind of coming to the end when I need to start analyzing all this information we've collected. And I'm happy to report we've collected 1,500 surveys so far. So that's a, a lot of surveys, I think. Um, it asks about um, where we missed the mark on um, bike, uh, on planned bike Ways. So where, where, where are there critical gaps in the bike network that you think are really important to plan for? Also, just generally, where should we focus our efforts going forward? So there's a question about prioritization. Um, and just, uh, you know, I've done a little bit of crunching of the data. Um, here is a map that shows all the zip codes. Um, and of the 1,500 or so, um, survey responses we've gotten, about 1,300 have given their zip code, so we can try to figure out where we're hearing from people. Um, you see a lot of survey responses from kind of Union Park and uh, McAllister Groveland, um, but then, um, you know, a, a, a fair amount, certainly a, a, a number of survey responses, you know, probably on the east side in total, maybe 200 survey responses. Um, so we're really grateful for that. And I would just ask that if you um, if you haven't taken it, or if you think someone you know would like to take it, please share that with them, stpaul.gov slash bike plan. Um, in terms of ages, uh, we've uh, I'm happy to report we've received responses from a pretty good cross section of, of people of certain ages. Uh, probably a month ago, we had one single person under 18 who had taken the survey, and I worked with St. Paul Public Schools. Um, to, so I went and hung flyers on the handlebars of students at Johnson High School. Um, so they would come out to their bike and see this survey. Um, so we've got now you know, over 100 in just a month. So I'm, I'm happy to report that because I know it's important for young people to be involved. Um, this is my last slide. Um, some of the initial kind of um, responses we've received from that survey at, again, stpaul.gov slash bike plan. Uh, people want a safe and separated um, connected network of bike facilities, so separation and connected of those facilities. Uh, winter maintenance, I mentioned, is a big thing. 
Um, connections to and from downtown. We've made a lot of progress in downtown St. Paul as part of the Capital City Bikeway, which is a network in downtown St. Paul, but people still want to be able to get to and from downtown. Uh, connections over barriers. That's something that we hear a lot. So, uh, you know, I, I've lived here my entire life and I'm only now really appreciating how many uh, railroad tracks we have. So, um, railroad tracks can be a big barrier because only some streets cross them. Um, and those same, same streets for bikes are good for cars also. So it's kind of a competition or not a competition, but there's limited space and we got to figure out how to prioritize that. Um, highways, of course, how do I get across a highway? Um, we've heard a lot of people ask for a connection to the Midtown Greenway in Minneapolis. So a connection over the river. Uh, we've asked, we've been asked to, as part of rethinking I-94, is there some way we can incorporate a, a, a bike facility? Uh, more bike parking. Uh, Paris mentioned that, um, but I spent kind of the whole summer thinking about um, where we should install bike racks on the east side. So if you're biking around the east side, you might see some more bike racks, especially on Payne and some of the other commercial corridors. Uh, and then just generally traffic calming. So how do we slow down traffic in our neighborhoods so that people can bike on any street? And that's all I have. Um, and I'd like to open it up for any discussion or um, thanks a lot for having me. Hey, thanks, Jimmy. Will you make me the host uh, right now? So there were a couple of comments in the chat that were great. And Steph Har, I'm unofficially just dubbing you the uh, the the tech social media helper for all meetings going forward. She dropped the link in <laughs> and dropped the information in. Um, thank you. Too. So thank you, Steph Hart. Um, Go ahead and take that folks, just open that window now. You know, we can always have a few more uh, responses from the east side. We're trying to hold up our third of the city on responses here. Um, and the more responses we have, the more interest we, we demonstrate for getting these amenities, not just elsewhere in the city, but also on the east side. So that would be great to have more folks reply. Um, Jimmy, so I had a couple of businesses say right away, and especially some on Payne Avenue, hey, I really want a bike rack out in front of my place. And I connected them with you. Are you still doing that work? If we've got other businesses say like, hey, I really like a bike rack out in front of my place. Yes, uh, candidly, I can share that we came kind of under budget for, um, you know, we kind of planned for we can install this many bike racks on the east side and we came in under budget, which is always nice. Um, so that means that we have some money left over. Great. Um, so if Paris, if, if you or anybody on the call uh, um, would, would like a bike rack and um, I, I will work with you for sure. It's, it's amazing how complicated <laughs> something as simple as a bike rack can be in terms of uh, where on the, on the street they can go, um, but surely I would be willing and of course and happy to work with anyone uh, if that wants a bike rack on the east side. Terrific. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks for that. I see um, Councilmember Jane Prince has her hand up and then we're going to go to a, uh, a little police update, not a little police update, but a police up, a brief police update. Councilmember Prince. And I'll be really brief. I'm so glad, Jimmy, that you're making this presentation to Isaba because no matter what the east side just doesn't have the the network of bike facilities that are on the other side of town I think part of that is that a lot of our um, a lot of our neighborhoods people just don't think of biking as an option I think we have a lot of opportunities to promote biking on the east side and one thing I want to point out which I hope you're aware of, but I know your um, colleagues are, is that the, Mar the, the west end of the Margaret Bike Boulevard, which is a wonderful facility, um, it, it kind of dead ends in um, Dayton's Bluff in um, just, let's see, just west or just north of East 7th Street. Um, it really is important that we create a connection between the Margaret Bike Boulevard and downtown, especially because we know that Kellogg Bridge will have a bike facility on it. Um, but it is a, it's kind of a big gap in the system that you can't get downtown from Margaret. So I just wanted to throw that out, but I, 
but I also am so glad that um, everyone is hearing this presentation and that we can all be thinking about um, building out our east side bike network. Thank you, Council Member Prince. You are, I, I presented to the Payne Phelan Community Council and that same comment came up. So thanks for seconding that. Um, yeah, and so the last thing I'll say is if, if you're willing um, to please uh, take, that, take that link that Stephanie, uh, thank you very much for putting that in the chat. It looks like Steph also dropped in uh, the pedestrian safety and traffic calming meeting that's coming up next week. I'll make sure that gets on our website too, Steph. Thanks so much for that. Um, let's do a little bit of work with, with Eastside Safety and then we'll do some announcements. I'll drop some announcements in the chat here in a minute. Uh, Senior Commander Kurt Hallstrom, do we have, I saw you on the call earlier. Did, was he able to hang out with us and stay? Um, look, there he is. I'm hey. here. You got you've got your St. Paul Saints gear on today. Uh, not quite. I just got an Under Armour hat because I haven't yet uh, hit the shower from the gym. Okay. So. Well, you know there are some advantages to doing virtual meetings. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, it is great to see you. Thanks so much for being on the show today. Um, tell us a little bit about what's happening on the east side as safety uh, and the, from the police perspective is is concerned. Sure. A um, couple of things. First of all. Uh, I, I, I'm excited about the, uh, the Hams Brewery possibilities. It, it's right across from my office. I look out every day to the, to the Hope Academy School edition and all the good things that are happening there. And uh, you know that, that uh, will definitely be a gem of the east side uh, when that's finally done. And as far as traffic calming and, and bike paths and all that other stuff, uh, can't wait to, to see it and hear what it, that, what it finally looks like because we all need to slow down a little bit. Uh, actually, we all need to slow down a lot of it, but um, uh, I digress. So everybody, you know, I think everybody understands that crime is kind of a cyclical pattern based upon the time of the year. Um, and we see certain crimes start to go up uh, in the fall and it's, it's almost like clockwork. Um, auto thefts, uh, some burglaries, uh, things that uh, you know, we don't see in the summer, mainly because the days are longer. You know, so the sun comes up at, you know, 4, 35 o'clock and it doesn't go down until almost 10 o'clock. So the window of opportunity is much smaller uh, in the summer months. Um, so we have seen a, you know, a, I don't know if I would call it a significant, but we have seen an uptick in auto theft, uh, you know, both uh, while, you know, well, a significant amount of times people are leaving their cars running uh, about 40 to 50% of vehicles are stolen with the keys while the vehicle is left running either at a gas station or on front of your house or, or wherever. So please, please, please uh, don't do that. Um, I know it's starting to get colder out, but um, don't do that. And I've said it before, you know, check your key fob to make sure that your car will not drive away. Even if you have the key fob in your hand in your house, um, Sometimes people are shocked and, and surprised that when their car is taken off down the road and they're standing there with the key fob. Um, so, so test that out. Um, you know, if you have an opportunity to install security lighting around your business or around your home, I highly encourage you to do that. Um, not necessarily an always on light, but motion sense lights, uh, security cameras. Uh, we, you know, we actually have a, a, a um, uh, a link that you can, uh, Paris, maybe I need to get that for you, but you can, you can share your um, address and name and phone number if you have security cameras on your business or residence. And then if a crime occurs in the general area of that uh, um, um, camera, uh, an investigator can go to this database and look at it and find out your address and give you a call to see if, you will, if you're willing to share that uh, that video camera with us. Video cameras solve a lot of crimes, even if it doesn't solve it directly. It, we're able to get a, a description of a vehicle or a description of a suspect, and we can work with that uh, much better than we can with just obviously without it. So, um, you know, that's uh, that's about it. Um, update on the police department. Um, you know, the unfortunate news: uh, our our boss is is wrapping it up. Yeah. Uh, next year, uh, I, I, it breaks my heart a little bit. I really thoroughly enjoyed working for Chief Axtell. Um, I've learned a lot. He's given me many, many, many opportunities um, that, that uh, I appreciate uh, more than I can express. 
Um, with that said, there'll be, you know, the, the police department's always been designed to keep going and somebody else will step into his shoes. And um, the good part about it is, is he has trained uh, anybody that will probably put in for that spot internally to, to operate very similar to the way he's done it. You know, vulnerability, uh, accountability, uh, responsiveness uh, are all things that he has uh, instilled in all of his commanders. And um, somebody will step in and carry on the tradition that he has laid out for us. Um, we started uh, October 11th with 66, I believe it was, recruits in the academy. We are at 64 now. Um, so we're still holding strong in the, in the 60 plus. They will hit the street in February and go on FTO and hopefully be out on the street uh, doing solo patrol uh, June-ish. So very, very excited to get them. I can't wait to get those, get those officers out on the street. Um, I don't even wanna speculate on how far we're gonna dip in our numbers before they uh, actually hit the street. So um, that's about all I have. I appreciate uh, all of you giving me an opportunity to tell you what's going on. Uh, any specific questions, I can throw my, my email address. I think you all have it, but I'll throw it in here. Um, Thank you. Chat. If you want to reach out to me, uh, Jane knows how to get a hold of me. Paris knows how to get a hold of me. I'm trying to look at all the people I know that I saw. Uh, Yolanda knows how to get a hold of me. Uh, Rebecca knows how to get a hold of me. Um, uh, um, there's one more that I'm I'm having a senior moment on, but uh, you you can get a hold of me if you need to. So appreciate it, everybody. Thank you, Paris, for uh, letting me join you today. Thanks so much for being here, Senior Commander. We're um, we're grateful, lucky to have you on the east side. We want you to stick around. Um, so don't think about taking that top job, okay? Anyway, no, go ahead. Think about it if you want to. You know, we, we, <laughs> we appreciate you. Uh, there's a question about catalytic converters. And I know that you were working on that real hard and helping folks mark them and figure out how to take care of them. And Crystal asks that uh, at 180 degrees, they've had some hit in their parking lot. You want to respond to that just briefly or take that offline with her maybe? Uh, sure. Um, well, I'm sure the group is is all interested in catalytic converters. Um, I know that uh, Minneapolis recently passed a, a city ordinance that makes it a crime to possess a catalytic converter, um, kind of sim very similar to what we were working with the, the state legislature on to try to get passed for August. Uh, it, we didn't get that one through um, this year, but I, I hope that there'll be some, uh, some legislature along the way that will want to try it again uh, the next time the opportunity presents itself. I'm not quite sure how that works at the Capitol. So if they'll have an opportunity this year, if we got to wait till next year, but um, as far as protecting your catalytic converters, you know, if you have high vehicles, you know, like a lot of commercial uh, establishments or nonprofits have vans to move people and vans to move stuff, the higher the vehicle is off the ground and the bigger the vehicle is, the more, more uh, sought after the catalytic converter and the easier it is to steal the catalytic converter because they have access to the underneath of the vehicle. And then they also have, uh, some of them have two, three catalytic converters on them. 